He understood everything. The moment he forgot everything else and he ran to the Lord. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul also, isn't it? While he was Saul, he used to do everything, all the outward things. As a Pharisee, he used to fast twice a week. Today is a Friday, I wonder how many have fasted. We don't even do that. But he used to fast twice a week. He had all the Bible passages written on his clothes. Pharisees used to do that. From early morning they used to pray. Which is more than what we do. But yet he had not found God. The lesson being we may do all these things but we cannot find God. Until God threw him down. Nicely he was riding. His plan was to go to Damascus. Drag out the Christians. His plan. Thrown down. The first thing that happened when he was thrown down. We are told is he became blind to everything. For three days he was blind. He could not see anything else. Suddenly he only could think and see God. That's the beginning of the great transformation from Saul to Paul. That's the beginning of the transformation of Simon Peter the fisherman. Who was blind to everything except the Lord at that moment. That's the beginning of the transformation for you and me. When one day we realize all these things that we are struggling and striving and tense about. Though we may be tense and worried about it, never has the Lord left us on the roads. And he did it only so that I may realize without him I can do nothing. Suddenly all the failures in your life, the depressions, the meaning behind it comes to you. The Lord did it for my good. Twenty-two years ago, lying on the paralyzed bed, because I was paralyzed, only this was moving. And mind you, by that time I had done two retreats at Divine Center. I had made good confessions. I had done everything. I was going for Mass, so by that time I was not a big sinner. In inverted commas, big sinner. And yet suddenly the Lord paralyzes me. And I pray and I pray. But I don't get healed. And I exercise my faith, so-called faith. I see myself already getting out of the bed. And I'm walking. Lord, I'm sure, I'm certain of it. It's not happening. Because it was not in the Lord's plan. So for 10 days I had to remain in the bed. Until on the 10th day came to me a priest. You know the rest of the story. How the Lord spoke to that priest and showed, you are doing all these things, but there is one person you have not forgiven from your heart. The Lord showed me that day, that you may do all outward things, but the inward man I can see. And that day when I forgave from my heart, making a confession also, in which I confessed all those people I had not forgiven and I was angry with and didn't want to look at, Three hours later I was walking. So for 10 days I remained in that bed and I was thinking what Simon Peter thought on the river that night. What bad? What is the good by it? I know Lord, you say everything you plan for me is good but what is good in this? What is good in this? I cannot move. What is good in the fact that I don't get a marriage partner? What is good in my sickness? There is a new man, that lady, who was confined to bed because she was paralyzed. And she, three months later, became blind also. The Lord said to her later, when he appeared to her, four years later, he said, Therese, do you want to get well? Her reply, Lord, anything you want. If you want to heal me, let it be like that. If you don't want to, anything you want. This is the faith of Mary. What you say and decide is best for me. That is real faith. God's plan will never fail in my life. It will always be for my good. And Jesus came to her and said, Today I restore to you your blindness. I take it away. And I come to thank you because you offered this suffering for me. I could save a person, a priest who was about to leave. 
I could use that suffering to save a person who was about to leave. Which means that through Teresa Newman, the Lord showed that sometimes when we invest our suffering, just as we invest in the bank, 10 rupees we have. Nowadays we don't go to put 10 rupees, do we? Some banks have what is known as pygmy collection, pygmy collection. Someone comes and every day you put 10 rupees, 5 rupees, 2 rupees, you remember. Every day Jesus comes to you with a pygmy collection. Anyone who is ready to offer suffering for me? Not big suffering, no one, don't worry, no one is going to crucify you. Small suffering, your husband has scolded you today. Despite your best efforts to please your children, your children shout at you. Isn't that suffering? Your childlessness, your other things. Do you know how many souls are being saved when you join that suffering on the cross to Jesus? There is a new man realized that her blindness was taken away that day. But the Lord kept her paralyzed in order to work another miracle for 32 years. She neither ate food nor drank water. And yet she did not die. And thousands of people would come to see this living miracle. Which the Lord kept only to show, I alone am sufficient for you. You who are so worried and stressed and strained about so many things. I alone am sufficient for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is faith therefore? Faith is my plan. I think what is best. So Lord grant it. I'm sure. I'm sure. Of course Hebrews 11 one says. To be sure. To be certain of things you cannot see. That is faith. But what kind of things? Your plan? Nah. Not your plan. That's why I want to deliberately speak about this because this has become almost a movement all over the world where people say, I have faith, but in fact they are only indulging in false faith. They have faith in their plan. When they close their eyes and they believe it's happening, they believe it is their plan happening. And faith was never meant to be that. Faith was meant to be, oh God, I don't know what is your plan for me, but one thing I'm sure, it is for my good. I cannot see anything good in this. Everyone has that which I don't have. But yet I believe it is for my good. Years later, if you look back, you will see in your life it has happened like that, isn't it? When you look at your life back at all the times you were broken and crushed, relationships broke up, people left you, maybe there was no peace at home, maybe that sickness came, maybe that great depression came financially on your family, and you were so worried and sleepless nights, tell me at the end of it, are you, were you left on the road? Did the Lord leave you on the road? Never. But he worked that situation so that you have the level of faith that you have today. That's exactly what the word of God says. He will always turn it for those. He will turn it. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We know that. We know that. In all things God works for the good with those who love him. Those whom he has called according to his purpose. Can you see that word in the middle of all that? L-O-V-E. You cannot really have faith unless you love the person. You know that? When you love the person, you know that person will never do anything bad for you. Never. Try convincing little David, his son. Take him aside and tell him, your daddy will poison you. David, he'll kill you. Don't trust your dad. He'll laugh at you and he'll say, Dada, come! Why? The one who loves me, I don't believe he will ever do anything bad for me. You know why our faith goes wrong? Because we have distrust of God. He has failed as we think in the past. That time when I needed you, you did not answer, you didn't give it to me. So today I say all the things. I praise you, I thank you, I love you, I trust you. But inside, you didn't give that thing to me. Look at that. Sometimes you may be well settled in life today. But still bitterness at the bottom of your heart. Lord, okay, I have no complaints, I'm okay today. But why I could not get that thing? The story of Joseph in the Old Testament. You heard about it, I told you yesterday. He was... Nicely living in Israel, his brothers sold him into Egypt. But thanks be to God, 
God was with him. So in Egypt, suddenly he became a very powerful man. But still in his mind, he must have been thinking. Okay, I have no complaints. I'm okay here. I have everything. But why the same thing could not happen in Israel? See? In other words, why that plan of mine could not have acted, succeeded? Why that original plan? Okay, Lord, I have no complaints. Okay. Praise the Lord. But that would have been better than this. See? Underneath that, what are you trying to say? I know better what is... I know better than you, Lord, what is, what is best for me. Faith is not that, dear friend. Correct your idea of faith today. And faith is what Mary believed. Lord, whatever it is, I know you will turn it to my good. That is why faith is so much connected with love. And when you are connected with love, then you are ready to change your plans. Do you understand that? So when you're in love and you have planned, I want to go to the market and your loved one comes and says, I know you want to go to the market, but please, I need you, please, come with me to the garden. I don't have time. Please, man. Even if you'll say no, it is because of the voice of the loved one, you'll say, okay, okay, I'll try to adjust. You change your plans, isn't it? Because she loved when the angel came to her and said, Mary, God requires you to produce a man. She had plans. She was supposed to get married. Like every young unmarried girl, she was thinking of a wedding day and how they will come and how they'll take her in a procession with the gungat on top and everyone will be there and such a happy day. And suddenly the angel appeared and said, Mary, even before getting Married, will you give your womb to God? If it was you and I, we would have said, Why, Lord, you have to come at this last minute? Huh? You had this in your plan. No point, Sangpano. Huh? You have reached me to the to the, the wedding hall door. And now you say, I, God's ways are like that. Can you understand? We can't accept it. But you can accept it when you love. And you know that. I love him. He will never do it for my bad. That's what Paul meant. We know in all things God works for good with those who love him. St. Peter says like this, he says, If you only have faith, it will not help you. But your faith should lead you to love. Your faith should lead you to love. To Peter, which incidentally is the last letter he wrote before he died. This Saint Peter, who at one time was grumbling, why, what is bad? I am lonely, not getting fish, everyone else is getting fish. Saint Peter writes, he says that unless you start with faith, but faith should keep on growing until it has reached the point of love. Because when you love, you trust, as it struck you. That in the picture that Jesus asked Saint Faustina to paint of him, it is the only picture that we have of what Jesus more or less looks like. And when she finished painting, of all words the Lord asked, the words down, Jesus, I trust in you. What is the meaning of I trust in you? I love you, Lord, and I believe you can never do anything for my bad. You can never do anything for my bad. You are the one who controls my whole life and everything. And Lord, I'm afraid sometimes when I ask you something, it may be according to my plan. It may be according to the thinking. What is bad? Everyone has it. What if I don't have it? Why should I not have it? I also want it. I am afraid when you take away something from me, I may become bitter and think that, okay, Lord, now you have blessed me with other things, but why did you take away that thing from me? Eight years now happily married. The wife came for counseling. She said to me in counseling, Brother, I've been in the charismatic renewal and I'm a woman of faith. I don't miss prayer meetings. I go here, go there to hear the word of God. But brother, somehow, sometimes I'm always fearful. I'm tense. I'm full of stress and strain. I'm worried, brother. I want to have faith and I believe I have faith. But I cannot get rid of this fear and worry. When prayer meetings are going on, going on I feel nice. I go out. Within two hours, I'm back into my 
fear syndrome worrying syndrome when we prayed the holy spirit said tell her does she love me i said the lord is asking you do you love him oh brother i really love the lord it is the lord only who has blessed me with such a good husband and everything when we prayed again the holy spirit said ask her tell her that i am asking her have you forgiven me for the time when that love relationship with so and so boy broke 15 years back in your life i asked her accordingly first of all her her jaw her, her jaw fell open because she knew there's no way i could have known about it and the second thing that happened was tears started streaming down her eyes and she said to me what i have been preaching to you brother you know i have no complaints about it because the lord has blessed me i said but in your heart do you wish that okay i'm blessed now but i wish it would have happened that way she said yes brother i think of it often i said to that extent you will all always have distrust of the lord the lord did fail me that time he didn't give me time and i needed to not give me but do you realize that was your plan you thought maybe that boy was a heavenly being but god could see further his plan was not for your damnation it was for your good you thought at that time that is best for you even till today though you're blessed you felt you feel lord why not that could have been given to me and i could be as happy as i am today which means your original plan is better than god's plan which means your wisdom is better than his which means you know better what is you know better than him what is best for you she was crying but isn't the isn't this the matter with all of us the problem with all of us it's a crisis of love it's a crisis where we do all things outside and we say the right things to him you are a mighty god you are this you are that but there is no love because areas of doubt and distrust have come why because in the past god may not have given you certain things indeed even in the present he may not have given you certain things or he may have taken certain things from you until today you cannot understand it and you feel lord why couldn't it be otherwise i'm happy today thank you lord very happy but why did you take that son of mine away couldn't i have been happy he also happy i would have been happy do you know can you imagine what could have happened if it was otherwise you don't know man as saint paul wrote he says everyone says 1 corinthians chapter 6 12 someone may say this is good for me that is good for me but you don't know what is good for you and so when you set your mind on something this is good for me you become slowly a slave of that i just want that i want that i want that that controls your mind that becomes the remote control of what is known as worry and tension because i feel that is best for me someone will say i'm allowed to do anything yes but not everything is good for you I could say I'm allowed to do anything but I'm not going to let anything make me its slave. Believe therefore in the Lord's plan. And therefore yesterday I began by telling you Jesus came to say your father is not a father who wants to damn you. And Jesus didn't even use the word father which is so formal father. He allowed the word the holy spirit allowed the translator to translate it as abba which is aramaic which means daddy god and we ended the prayer meeting with that word for you tell me when you are in problems and you are in tension god doesn't want big prayers even when you look to him and sigh and groan and say daddy god that's prayer already that's reaching him not required to say all the big formal things that we say malan here is a full timer he's also an electronic engineer and he's the head of his family he's a preacher too 
But when little David, his son, is in problem or is tense, he doesn't come to him and say, Oh, great preacher, full-timer, electric, electronic engineer, and my father, help me. He doesn't say it. He just says, Dada! Can you understand? Can you understand? Over the strains of my voice coming to you, over the mic, the Holy Spirit is reverberating in your heart. The love of the Father. He loves us. And we want proof, don't we? Always. That's why Jesus said in John 14, he said, If you do not believe me, at least believe me because of my deeds. Because of what I'm doing, at least believe me. He came down to our language, see. He says, if you do not believe that your father cares for you, at least believe because of what I'm doing and what he did, you know, and I know. And yesterday I lifted it to show you. And if you want to know how much it pains to be on the cross, please go home tonight and take a big cupboard and tie your one hand with silk cloth and the other hand with a silk cloth to the top of the cupboard and just see how long you can, you can remain there. Just see how long you can remain. With silk cloth. And it must take a lot of love, no? To hang there on nails. And Jesus said, if you don't believe me, please believe me because of my deeds. Believe me. Believe in me when I say I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. If not, believe because of the things I do. And when you start believing in your heart and you know that God loves you, your Father loves you. God is too formal. God, God, God. Mighty God. Even father is formal. Abba, daddy, God, daddy God. Immediately rises to heaven. That is prayer already. Prayer is not long time in one location. Nah. Prayer is dependence on God. I can't do anything without you, my God. Daddy God, I don't know, I'm crushed. Help me, Daddy God. It's prayer more powerful than half an hour of saying all sorts of meaningless things. And that is what St. Paul says. He says, the Holy Spirit, slowly when you fall in love with the Father, He will teach you to pray in groans and sighs. Groans and sighs. Ah, Daddy God, ah. The prayer is reached. Mighty God and Savior, you who are to be praised by the whole world, and you who put everything under my feet, I appeal to you. Ah, <laughs> so many things which nothing, we don't mean one word even. Daddy God. The Holy Spirit will teach you in sighs and groans. And the Holy Spirit who teaches you in sighs and groans, He knows what you're praying in sighs and groans. Groaning. Some of us don't groan at all. That's the problem. Huh? We face a lot of problems in our life, but okay, I can manage. <laughs> I can manage. Like some people ask him, So how are you? Uh, not bad, uh, not bad. <laughs> I once asked a far relative of mine, I know he was broken. His love affair had broken and she had turned against him. And uh, I said to him, so, how are you? How are you pulling on? Not bad, okay, I'm managing. <laughs> it's because of this we cannot find God, because we are managing. Because the day you realize I cannot manage, that is the day you will realize, Jesus said, come to me only those who are weary and overburdened, they cannot manage and they will find rest. They are too polished, isn't it? That's why we think, okay, I can manage. Okay, I've been hurt, I've been cheated, I've been broken, but what is that? I can manage, isn't it? Learn to groan. 
In the same way the Spirit comes to help us weak as we are. We don't know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. The Israelites were in Egypt. For about 400 years they suffered. Like slaves. In the beginning it was good. But later on they started being ill-treated like slaves. Five years, ten years, twenty years like slaves. My question when I was studying. The Bible was, Lord, why did you take so long? I mean, you, your plan was to take them across the Red Sea and save them and bring them out of Egypt and out of that problem. Why did you do it earlier? Until I fixed my eyes and I was reading Exodus chapter 3 which says, I heard their groans. I heard their groans. And I have seen their problems. And therefore now I am going to send Moses in order to bring them out. Which means that it was not why God took so long. But it took why it took so long for the Israelites to groan to God. I can manage. Not bad, man. <laughs> I can manage. It's a bad situation, but uh, not too bad, you know. I can still manage, isn't it? That's why we never find Christ. You understand? But a child with his humility, and for the sake of your information, I'll tell you, whether you're 90 years old or 100 years old or 6 years old, you and I are all children in God's sight. It doesn't matter your age. To you, to him, you are just a child. And your behavior, your behavior towards him indicates your dependence. And I'll tell you one thing. Spiritual growth is not how many gifts you have. I have so many gifts. I can touch a person and he can fall down. I have gifts of tongues. No, 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 no. I can say all the... That's not spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is this. I am conscious of all my weaknesses, of all my failures. But I know that my God will always turn it in the end for my good. And I depend on Him. For everything I depend on Him. I can do nothing without Him. 